from Boston, Massachusetts. It's the Cube covering Red Hat Summit 2017. Brought to you by Red Hat. Welcome back to theCUBE's coverage of the Red Hat Summit. I'm Rebecca Knight, your host, with my co-host here, Stu Miniman. We are joined by Mike Ferris. He is Vice President Business Architecture at Red Hat. Thanks so much for joining us, You're Mike. welcome, glad to be here. I want to start out by talking about the Amazon announcement. We, we already had Jim Whitehurst on the program. He told us about the auspicious uh, business meeting he had in Seattle, the breakfast meeting. Yep. You're a big player in, in how this is going to actually work in practice. Can you tell us a little bit more about it? Sure, so, so it's really exciting for us in that, you know, what, what we we have done with Amazon is, is jointly deliver the power of the public cloud to hybrid and private clouds through OpenShift. Uh, so a, a lot of what we've been talking with customers over the past several decades now has actually been about you know, how do you take enterprise software and make open source applicable to it? How, how do you really evolve your infrastructure and technologies in that context? Um, and with the emergence of the public clouds, specifically Amazon, starting in 2007, 2008, uh, you know, customers started taking the same technologies and using them on Amazon. Uh, and we certainly grew into that model and, and really helped grow that evolution of customers to move to the public clouds. Um, but, but what's been happening over the past couple of years is customers have been asking, now that they're looking at things like Red Hat OpenStack, starting to look at alternative deployments, and even emerging into the application platforms and container platforms, how can they take a lot of the power that specifically Amazon has been developing in the public cloud side and deliver it to those applications regardless of where they run? Uh, and so, you know, between Jim's meeting, uh, certainly with Andy Jassy, and then sitting down and talking about what types of evolution could we help grow for application developers in the, in the on-premise and hybrid environments, it really came out that, you know, the full suite of application services that Amazon has produced uh, really provided a, a good stronghold for us to be able to say to the customers, if we could provide those to you on-premise, and give you the ability to scale and use innovative solutions from AWS without having to worry about different interfaces, uh, different relationships, and actually come to Red Hat and say, OpenShift is the center for your application and container platforms. Uh, we thought it was an excellent example of saying we could take what Amazon's doing, delivered inside OpenShift to those customers. And this is a big, a really big revolutionary change. Can you just project out for us five years from now, where, where will we be in terms of OpenShift and in terms of this partnership? So a big piece of this is actually, you know, going back to the early promises of Java and other you know, polyglot platforms saying, if you write an application, it can run anywhere. Well now what's happening is that's starting to come true in that with the emergence of hybrid and this concept of on and off premise, you, know, you did have the concept that you could take an application and move it, you can move it from one place to the other. Now, in, in having applications written to container platforms like OpenShift and having used services that may be local or may be remote in a very consistent way, you're able to take those applications and use them everywhere. So we do see this in you know, the next several years, enabling customers and applications to be much more mobile, uh, leveraging resources where they're best run, uh, and be able to take the platforms and have customers really, really grow the innovative solutions on premise in the same way they've been able to do in the public clouds like AWS over the past several years. Mike, can you walk us through what the rollout of this is going to look for, like? When can customers get their hands on it? Uh, yeah, how's, mm -hmm. you know, when's the training for all of your partners uh, going to come? Yeah, so we're, we're early in the phases now with yeah. AWS, uh, and you saw a demo today. Yeah. Uh, we had an excellent demo with, uh, you know, with Amazon and Red Hat on stage showing the integration. Um, you'll see early versions of it in the next couple of months, uh, and then customers will certainly be able to include that in their applications as they're deploying OpenShift. Uh, like, likewise in the fall or a little bit later than that. So over the coming year you'll see this happen in the market. Okay, great. And you know, Andy Jassy in the video talked that there's you know, thousands of Amazon services. How do we understand what's, you know, it, it's great to say, great I can get Amazon you know, in sure. a small deployment, but the devil's in the details and how's the networking work between you know, my on-premises stuff and, and the public cloud. Can you help us un unpack and how do, how do we look at this? The beauty of this yeah. is uh, you as a developer yeah. uh, are, who, who maybe you've become familiar with AWS services, RDS, Route 53, et cetera, it's the same services delivered through OpenShift. So you, your experience in understanding all, everything that you've learned from Amazon, maybe doing some tests within the public cloud or deploying other applications in the public cloud, it's going to look exactly the same on premise and in the hybrid environment with OpenShift itself. Uh, so all the trainings and all the learnings that you've gone through will, will apply directly as well. Um, as you start to deploy and build and deploy applications, the beauty of this, as I said, is you're going to be able to take them and use them on-premise or in the public cloud without any changes. 
and again, through that interface where uh, OpenShift will provide you the configuration, the ability to, uh, to deploy and manage, for example, an RDS database, uh, and have that be visible within your application in a very consistent way, even if you take it from one instance of OpenShift and move it to another. You can take the application, move it up into Amazon itself on OpenShift, and it'll run exactly the same. Okay. How should customers think about how they're going to be paying for this kind of thing? You know, I think they, mm -hmm. they understand one of the things that Red Hat has done a great job is, right, I, I want to start doing containers, I want to start doing OpenShift. You, sure. you guys have you know, streamlined a lot of, a lot of those, uh, you know, how the financial interactions work. You guys are you know, subscription model uh, as to how you do things. How, how do I look at this, whether I'm doing it in the public cloud, doing it on premises, how am I going to be able to compare those two? So we're not announcing anything different in that model today. Um, and, and one of my core responsibilities for Red Hat is business architecture, which really means what are the models that customers are adopting in the market, how can Red Hat respond to those and start to grow what's happening. Um, so what we've started with, with AWS here is really a technical integration and a services integration, such that we will be able to help customers when they come to us with a question on their OpenShift deployment. Let's say they are using RDS and they want to understand, am I deploying it properly, is it being integrated? We will have knowledge about that. Uh, but they're still going to go directly to Amazon for their financial transaction. So buy the services from who you're actually acquiring them from, but use them together wherever you deploy them. Uh, and that's, that's really the, the crux of this. Um, as we evolve, you know, certainly we're open to looking at alternative business models. If customers start to say, well, I want to acquire this everything from Red Hat or everything from Amazon, it certainly would be an option, but we're not yet there. In thinking about business models, I mean, this has been a recurring question because Red Hat's success appears to be a one-off in the open source world. Why is the open source business model so challenging? I mean, as you said, it's, it's selling free is hard, um, but you're a 17-year veteran of this company. What's your perspective? Um, so, so there are multiple areas, right? One, one of the core ones that I always speak to customers and partners alike about is that we are very, very well, uh, internally we, we understand very well the difference between a product and a project. Uh, and so when we go into uh, technology, we always make sure that it's open source, whether we're acquiring a company, whether we're starting a project, or joining, in, in, like we did with OpenStack, a significant existing project. Um, but that is a technical investment. It's something that we want to make sure that we have significant, uh, not just ownership of in the community, but, but in individuals inside the company that are involved, invested, and maintainers of projects. But then likewise, when we look at how we're going to service customers, we think about long-term life cycles, we think about how can we maintain uh, our support models, our, our financial models, everything across that, and that's what really helps turn it into a product for them, uh, and for us specifically. And so, you know, this, this differentiation in talking about technology versus the business is very important to us. You know, it does mean that we have to make some very explicit promises to customers and stick to those. Things like saying to the market that we will support our products for 10 year life cycles means that we have to be very rigorous in the testing, very rigorous in the updates, making sure that over that 10 years, we can service the customers the way that we started to, uh, but all from that same open source project. Um, so it's really the purity of giving back to the community, staying involved in the community, but then also focused on the customer needs and the value that our enterprise businesses want to pay us for. Mike, in, in, the, in the keynote, uh, one of the statistics that, that Red Hat shared was that 59% of your customers have a multi-cloud environment. Mm -hmm. Can you share with us how you know, your team, how you're helping customers think about that architecture, be a little bit more strategic? Our viewpoint is most customers you know, are a lot multi-cloud because they've been very tactical uh, and very much done in application by application where things fit, haven't necessarily, like they have forever with IT, you know, had a grand strategy that pulls it all together. It's kind of like, oh, I need this and therefore that did or pricing was good. How are you helping customers uh, with, with both advice and with architecture? So uh, it's not something that we use a lot now, uh, but in the early days of Red Hat, the word choice was really a core part of vocabulary. Right, and so giving back to the community, uh, let our customers you know, be able to say, all right, I always know that what Red Hat's doing is in the open source community, and I can always do it on my own if I choose. Well, what, what choice means now is being able to say back to them, well, regardless of where you're running these technologies, and, and for ones that you are paying Red Hat for, that you're buying subscriptions from us, we will make sure that they perform efficiently, uh, that they have the, the appropriate security mechanisms in place, and they work the same way across all the platforms that you can deploy. 
And that includes things such as pricing models and business models, because we certainly don't want to introduce arbitrage, make it confusing for customers to acquire. Choice overload. Yeah, and yeah. so, so in, in the end, what we're really trying to do is make sure that when a customer goes out and deploys a technology from us, they can use it wherever they want, uh, that, that they can get support for what they want, and that they're paying a fair price across all of those. Uh, and so when we talk about multi-cloud, we're very careful about making sure that that technology works everywhere. Uh, so whether it's this integration with AWS on the services, with OpenShift, or whether it's just Red Hat Enterprise Linux performing very efficiently and securely across every public cloud in the world, uh, we're making sure that we have those hooks in place everywhere. When we're thinking about the, the cloud industry and, and, the, and the future and where it's going, I know, I know that you are a technology evangelist, you yourself have 50 patents. What, is, what do you see the future holding? What will we be talking about at the Red Hat Summit in 2020 and 2025? So one, one of my big motivations and the company's motivations is to continue to make technology easily consumable. You see this has already happened in the public clouds with Amazon being able to give people credit card transactions and, and start up a server literally in minutes where it used to take weeks or months for, for procurement. Um, as people do this, as microservices start to emerge more, uh, as security becomes a larger context for what they have to do in their environments to make sure that they're operating securely, our objective is to make sure that regardless of the platform that we're producing, regardless of the underlying technology, that we make it easy for them to be able to build and deploy and manage those environments everywhere. Uh, so, you know, what that may turn into, and, and the hope certainly is that, you know, technology gets out of the way over time and customers, application developers, can really focus on the innovation that ties back to their business, rather than which project are they using from the community or which proprietary product have they purchased. And it really becomes about the businesses that they're in rather than technology. You, you talked about security being number one on the minds of customers, also privacy. I, we also hear that US customers, just individuals, aren't as concerned about privacy and security as perhaps they should be. Do, do you see that following and just into the consumer group? Will, will the consumers take the lead of corporations? Um, so, so when we talk about our enterprise customers, certainly security is a big piece of it. And if you look back when we started Red Hat Enterprise Linux, you know, a primary piece of that was making sure that we always had immediate response to security issues with our products in the market. Um, that has continued as we've grown the portfolio to be the, the broad stack of solutions that we have today. Uh, what's happening now, and especially with this move toward containers, is all the value that we built into that security mechanism into Red Hat Enterprise Linux, now starts to apply to the container environment. And so as, as really, and, and you think we've said this a couple of times already, you know, containers are Linux and Linux is containers. You start to stretch that out some, and that means that security is just as important, and it's actually more important in a containerized application world than it was just in Linux. So this, this value of being able to say to a customer, you know, security's important, we've helped answer that question for Red Hat Enterprise Linux and the other products that we produce. Now we're able to answer that as you move into the microservices world, as you start to have applications you're developing or other applications from ISVs that are containerized on Red Hat hosts and Red Hat containerized environments. Security is already part of that. So it really becomes you know, handed to the users for the end result. So Mike, you've been with Red Hat for, for many years and you know, we, we've heard kind of culture at the core uh, of what's doing. The, the question I have for you is, we see just the, the rapid pace of change even more. How does a company like Red Hat keep up uh, you know, with this increasing pace? You know, I, I think about how, when, you know, how long it took Red Hat Enterprise Linux to get adoption and rollout and things like that versus you know, OpenShift we, was way more recent and, and is coming much faster mm -hmm. and there's you know, just that increased pace of change. What do you see that's changed and what's, what's the same at Red Hat for you? Um, so sameness really yeah. goes back to our commitments to community, commitments to value. Uh, and uh, you know, I've, I've been here, again, 17 years, and you know, I will say that every individual in the company I trust. And that trust, the, the fact that you know, the ethical nature of the, the way we operate, uh, the executive leadership of the company, certainly helps me uh, maintain that, that sameness across you know, the, the now approaching decades that I've been at the company. Um, how we keep up with the rapid pace of change, uh, you know, that's always a challenge, um, but everyone in the company continues to look forward to how do we help mature the value that Red Hat provides and how do we make sure we maintain our, our completeness and integration with the open source communities. So it's the community that's driving us 
from a technology view and the customers as well in that context, but we, we want to make sure that we put back to that and we continue to invest in you know, the core DNA that really made you know, Red Hat Linux, even before Red Hat Enterprise Linux, uh, successful when it started. Mike, thanks so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. Thank you. I'm Rebecca Knight for Stu Miniman. We will return with more of theCUBE's coverage of the Red Hat Summit.